I'm going to talk a little bit about complex transfer functions. Before I do that, let's go ahead and review the second order equation that we had learned in previous lectures. What we do is we first put it into standard form. Then we decide what type of input we're going to have, whether a step response, a sinusoidal response, or other input, input functions. I'm going to go down the step response route. And let's say we have an underdamp system. Underdamp systems have uh, oscillation. They have some overshoot. They approach uh, the, the new steady state value faster than critically damped or overdamped systems. So critically damped, those have zeta equals 1. Uh, for underdamped, you have zeta less than 1, but greater than 0. And then overdamped are zeta greater than 1. So overdamped are the slowest responding uh, second order systems. And those are given by equations uh, that are shown here. Critically damped, uh, again, equation 550, and then underdamped 551. Now, with underdamped, one of the advantages of dealing with underdamped systems is there are some nice equations that relate overshoot period and rise time to zeta and tau. So we can observe overshoot period or rise time and, and be able to calculate an approximate value of zeta or tau. Now, of course, I'd prefer to use some of squared errors or optimization method to obtain those uh, from data, but there, it is possible to do it graphically as well. Okay, so let's, let's talk about higher order systems. So what do we do when we have something that is a higher order than a second order polynomial in the denominator? In this case, this is a third order polynomial. What kind of tools do we have to be able to analyze these systems? Now, uh, we, we're going to be talking today about uh, stability, uh, of the um, of the system again, we learned in you know if we have any roots with uh, real parts that are in the right hand plane or positive real roots, and you do have an unstable system. And we're also going to be um, looking at at things like oscillation of these higher order systems as well if they have complex uh, roots. Okay, so transfer functions can generally be represented uh, as these higher order transfer functions as a polynomial in the numerator and then a polynomial in the denominator. Now the polynomial in the numerator, the, the roots of those are called zeros. And the roots of the polynomial in the denominator, those are called the poles. And okay, there's going to be some interesting characteristics of each of those that I'll discuss in uh, the next couple slides. Uh, so uh, we can also put this into a form called a time constant form. Now, now, this is very familiar from your first order systems and, and potentially second order systems, this form where you have these time constants. In this case, you have multiple time constants there in the denominator. Uh, but this is an alternate form uh, where you can have a gain and then your time constants here for each of your roots. Okay, now one other thing to realize on these systems is that the order of the polynomial in the denominator has to be greater than or equal to the order of the polynomial in the numerator. Otherwise, this is a system that can't be actually uh, uh, implemented in practice. So it's not a, a physical system if that isn't the case. OK, so let's talk a little bit about poles and zeros. Uh, poles show the stability of the process uh, and also show uh, whether it's going to be oscillating or smooth. Now, zeros show some dynamics. Uh, zeros can also uh, be used to predict something uh, called an inverse response. Uh, so what we do is, is we typically use these poles and we plot them on the real versus imaginary axis with an x. The zeros will plot on the real imaginary axis with a, a zero, okay, or an o uh, on that uh, axis. Okay, so uh, just you know, if we plot them, we can very quickly see if we have any poles on the right-hand side of the plane, and if we do, even one pole on the right-hand side of the plane, it means that the system is going to be unstable. Uh, so just even one pole on the right-hand side of the plane, the system is unstable. Now, if you have any poles that are not uh, just purely real numbers, but they also have some imaginary components as well, it means that, that we have an oscillatory system uh, where we're going to see some oscillation. Now, this is going to be this is going to be an unstable system because we see a real part in the right-hand plane. Um, and uh, it's also going to be oscillating because we see the imaginary parts of, of some of the uh, poles as well. 
Now, the interesting thing also is that uh, poles that have imaginary parts always come in pairs. Uh, so that you'll always see, if you see one pole on this side, side of the plane, you can pretty much uh, put a mirror in between them, and, and you would expect to see one uh, here as well. Okay, so poles that are uh, very far away from the axis, these are going to be very fast. Okay, so have very uh, little influence on the, um, uh, you know, they're, they're going to come to, they're going to, uh, the effect is going to be very short-lived. Okay, so. Uh, but something that is on the you know, closer to the origin, that's going to be something that's going to be nearly an integrating process or have a very long time constant or time to steady state. Okay, so um, the gray area, again, that's the unstable area. And then uh, oscillatory systems are uh, have imaginary components. Okay, so zeros, what do they tell us? Uh, they have no effect on system stability. So you can have zeros that are in the right-hand plane, and the system will still be stable uh, if all the poles are in the left-hand plane. Now, uh, a zero in the right-hand plane, it, you, almost, you, you can also uh, sometimes see an inverse response. Okay, so an inverse response is where you know, this is a steady-state value, but initially it's going to go the opposite direction and then approach the uh, steady state value. OK, so uh, what are some, some systems that, that might exhibit inverse response? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about those uh, later as well. Uh, OK, so here's an example. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on this example. Uh, there's uh, a solution and very detailed uh, instructions in the textbook. Uh, but I just wanted to show a, uh, you know, this is a very simple example with uh, two two poles and then one zero. Okay, the the poles are going to be at negative one over tau two and negative uh, negative one over tau one, and then the zero is going to be at negative one over tau a. Okay, so you get the poles and zeros by setting uh, the denominator equal to zero. Okay, the characteristic equation, and then also the uh, the polynomial in the numerator equal to zero, and then solve for the roots. Of those uh, of those systems, um, so the solution to this is given in 615, and you see tau a, you know tau a was it here in the numerator, and then tau one and tau two um, are here as well. So you have these ratios here with these exponential terms. Now one of these one of these ratios, okay, can be negative, and the other one can it can be positive depending on uh, the the magnitude of a and, and the value. Um, whether it's positive or negative. And I, I just want to show this, uh, this next plot. Um, okay, so this is as you vary tau a. Now tau 1 is equal to 4, and tau 2 is equal to 1. So both stable, uh, stable poles. But now you're going to vary the location of that 0. Um, and this shows if you have a 0, uh, you know, if you adjust tau a to be negative 4, you see an inverse response. Uh, you know, as you get uh, higher and higher, then, uh, you know, this is tau a equals 16, you actually see some overshoot uh, before it comes back to steady state. So this is the influence. This plot shows the influence of tau a on the system. Okay. Um, you know, one, one example of, of uh, an inverse response, uh, you know, as you initially increase the steam to a reboiler, you can have uh, uh, some frothing or spillage on the, on the first trays, which can uh, exhibit this, this type of inverse response where you have uh, potentially, um, you know, you, you, you uh, first have this, this uh, this response down before it goes back up again. So that's just one example of, uh, of an inverse response on a level on some of your trays uh, for the, the reboiler change, so an increase in steam to the reboiler. OK, so let's take a look at an example problem. Uh, this is a higher order system. This is a third order polynomial here in the denominator. There's no 0 in the numerator. OK, so we can simplify it down a little bit. We can go. Uh, from uh, the, this polynomial, we can uh, divide it by 2 in the numerator and denominator. And then we can uh, factorize this in, to be able to see 
uh, some of our poles more easily. So we have one pole here at negative one-third, and we want to be able to compute the other pole. So one way to do that uh, is through uh, the quadratic formula. That's the one that I prefer. Another way uh, to do it is to uh, convert to the sine-cosine form, uh, such as this is like we'd be wanting to convert this back to the time domain from some of our Laplace tables. Okay, so we would, uh, so in, in this case, this is a sine-cosine form, and then the, the uh, poles also come out of that. This would be the, uh, the real part, uh, S, S, so you just take the negative one-fourth, and then you take the square root of this part to get your imaginary part uh, for your pole, plus or minus. Okay, all, all of these imaginary roots, uh, they, they come in pairs. Okay, so this is a sine-cosine form. You can also uh, do this by the quadratic formula to get your roots of the, in, in, and be able to calculate your poles. Okay, so now let's plot these. Uh, now this, in, in this case, this is the imaginary axis, okay, and then this is the real axis. Okay, so all of our, all of our poles are on the left-hand side of the plane. They're all negative for their real parts. So, so that's a good sign. It's going to be stable, a stable system. Um, you know, that you do have uh, some, some roots that have some imaginary parts to them, so it's going to oscillate, but it'll eventually converge uh, to a, a steady state value. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, problem 6.1. And I'm going to actually do this one in MathCAD. This is a, a fifth order polynomial in the denominator and then a uh, second-order polynomial in the numerator. And so we're going to be able to calculate the zeros and poles. And what we want to do uh, with this example is be able to plot the poles and zeros on a plot to be able to say something about the system response of this higher-order system. Okay, so I'm going to exit out of the uh, PowerPoint and then go to, uh, you know, a MathCAD sheet. And okay, so let's go ahead and start on this problem 6.1. Uh, what I'm going to do first of all is go ahead and write out the, the transfer function that we had uh, from that problem. In this case, g of s is going to equal 0 0.7 times s squared uh, plus 2 times s plus 2. Uh, so those are, um, that's a polynomial in the numerator. And then we also have s to the fifth uh, plus that wrong. Okay, s to the fifth plus five times s to the fourth plus two times s to the third minus four times s squared uh, plus six. Okay, now we don't have an s term there. You know, we could also uh, write, you know, if you are wondering where that went or, or just want to keep track of it, you could also put zero s there if you wanted. I'm just going to leave that out um, for this one. Okay, so plus 6. Now we're going to calculate, first of all, the zeros with MathCAD. Now we could do this uh, pretty easily with the quadratic formula. I'm just going to show some of the functions of MathCAD uh, to be able to do this. So I have my polynomial. I have uh, S squared. Uh, I'm just going to copy that from up here. Okay, the polynomial uh, right there. And, and what I'm going to do is... is uh, Go ahead and evaluate uh, the coefficients of that. Now, now that is uh, just the 2, uh, 2, and 1. Okay, so it's a way to just extract the coefficients from that polynomial. And what I'll do is just go ahead and put that into a vector, um, you know, assign that to uh, the, the, the z variable. Okay, so for our zeros, uh, those are our, our zeros. And then what I want to do is uh, calculate my zeros as the poly roots uh, of z. Okay, in this case, the roots, um, uh, sorry, the zeros are going to be uh, listed here. Okay, so I could have done that with the quadratic formula. You can also do it in MathCAD uh, very easily. So I'm going to do the same thing uh, for my denominator as well to be able to calculate these roots. Okay, in this case, I'll just sign P equals um, that, and I'm going to do the shift, or the control shift period to get the, uh, the, the evaluation. Okay, and then I'm going to type in coefficients 
here, coefs uh, there to get my um, coefficients of that polynomial. Okay, so it starts with uh, this one, 6, and I have 0 for the s term, negative 4 for the s squared term, and on down. Okay, then I'm going to get my poles. Okay, those are going to be the poly roots, um, and the poly roots of P. Okay, so let me see what those poles are. Now, I should have um, I should have five of those. Okay, so for a fifth order polynomial uh, with six coefficients here, I should have five roots. And you can see immediately that you have some imaginary numbers here. And now we want to plot these these poles and these zeros. Uh, of, of, you know, the roots of these system on a plot that, where we can perhaps see them graphically. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with just five, it's pretty easy. But if you have a higher order system, like maybe a, a tenth order system, it's very nice to see them, to see them graphically. So I'm going to go ahead and just create a new plot here. And what I'll do is, uh, you know, make this a little bit larger so we can see. And... And then I'm going to plot the imaginary part. I'll just do the IM part of my poles. Okay, and then I'll do my real part. So this will extract the real and the imaginary part of my poles. Now it's going to do a line by default. So I'm going to change this uh, from a line, okay, to a symbol. Now, now for the zeros, or, or the poles, we want to do the Xs. Uh, for those. And I'll increase the size just a little bit. Okay, so there are our um, our poles of our system. Okay, the, the roots of the denominator. Now what I'm going to do as well is go ahead and define uh, let me go in here I need to just do a comma there um, and I'm going to do the imaginary part of my zeros. Okay, and I'll do as well the real part of my zeros. Okay, and uh, when I click enter, I'll see a line again. I got got to go ahead and double click on that on that plot, and uh, I'll change this now to a an O there. Uh, we we typically put the zeros as O's, and then go ahead and get rid of the line, so I can see the location of those, and click OK. Let me go ahead and make this just a little bit larger so we can see those, so it isn't just right at the edge of the plot. And I'm going to put this at negative 6 and then at 2. Okay, so now we have our plot, our imaginary axis, which is the y-axis, and then our real axis, which is the x-axis. And we see immediately that we have, this is the, the separation between the left-hand side of the plane and the right-hand side of the plane. We see we have some some roots of our uh, of our denominator that are, are there in the right hand side of the plane. Uh, so this is going to be an unstable system. Now you also see that uh, you know these uh, you know these two poles here are pretty close to these zeros. You know if they're close to each other, it's almost like the effects cancel each other out. If they're right on top of each other, they will cancel each other out. Okay, so it's like dividing the numerator denominator by the same thing. Um, you know, or same terms in numerator, denominator, and the cancel. Okay, so if those two are on top of each other. Uh, but it is going to oscillate, and it's going to diverge, because you can see that uh, you have some poles in the right-hand side of the plane. Now, this one is a very fast time constant. Uh, it's not going to affect too much the system response, uh, because it has such a fast time constant to that, that pole. Okay, so there's our plot. Uh, that we generated. Uh, so we had our poles that we calculated with MathCAD um, and then generated our trend uh, for, for this. Okay, so let's go on to the next topic, which is polynomial approximations um, for time delay, or e to the negative theta s. Theta is our, our time delay. Um, if you remember the, the Taylor series expansion for e to the negative uh, theta s, or you know the exponential function, um, it's it's this form. Okay, so you have uh, this is out to a fourth order polynomial. It continues on, uh, but we're we're just going to take this these first two terms, just like we did for linearization, 
um, we're just going to take the first two terms of Taylor series expansion and use these to approximate our time delay. Okay, so so for let's say for example uh, we want um, you know it isn't desirable to have a uh, time delay. Uh, let's say in the numerator or or some other place, we can approximate it and get a polynomial. Um, also, if we have a polynomial uh, and we have some factors that we want to approximate as time delay, so we can go back or forth. But we're just going to take these first two terms in the Taylor series ex expansion. Another way to do that is is through a pod A approximation. Now, this formula is given in 635 um, equation 635, but this has both uh, a numerator term and a denominator. So it's going to add a zero and a pull to our system. This is the 1-1 one, one pot A approximation. You can have higher order uh, pot A approximations as well. But we're just going to stick with uh, just uh, the simplest uh, forms for both pot A and Taylor series expansion. OK, so this is a way to approximate the, uh, the time delay for a system. OK, so approximation. So we're trying to approximate e to the negative uh, theta s. Now, we're interested in time delays that are greater than or equal to 0. And this shows the pot A approximation, the 1-1, one, one, the 2-2 two, two pot A approximation, and then this blue line is the actual exponential. So you can see for the period that we're concerned about, um, you know, for making this approximation of time delay greater than or equal to uh, 0, uh, the, they fit very well. Okay, so pot A is a good approximation. Uh, Taylor series is also very easy to apply. It's not quite as good of an approximation. Okay, so uh, let's say we have a small values of S. Um, now these are the very fast, uh, you know, the, the, the very small time delays. We can approximate those as a very fast uh, a system response or another root in either our numerator or denominator that has a very small value. So, so you can take this time delay, theta naught, that might be very small, and approximate it with 1 minus theta s, and then just include that in your transfer function. Um, you know, if you want to put it in your denominator, um, you can make this approximation where you basically invert this, and, and then it becomes e to the theta s instead of e to the negative theta s, and then you can place this into your denominator. Okay, and so in this case, we have we have a root uh, that's going to be at negative one over uh, a theta naught. Now, if theta naught is very small, then that that uh, that root uh, becomes a very large negative number. Okay, so very fast dynamics doesn't doesn't affect our system too much, uh, but it gives a, an approximation to that time delay. Okay, so let's consider uh, this transfer function, um, where we have one, uh, where we have one zero at um, negative, at uh, sorry, at, at positive ten, um, and then we have some zeros. This zero is at negative two, uh, negative one third, and then negative point two. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to approximate this higher order system right here with um, a first order system plus dead time, okay, or, or time delay model. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some of our, our uh, poles here and also our zero and throw those into the delay term with, uh, you know, with these either pod A approximation or Taylor series. In this case, we use Taylor series expansions uh, to, to make this approximation. Okay, so for the numerator term, let's look at the numerator first. Uh, you know, the, the equation then says we should add e to the negative 0.1s um, as, a, as a time delay. So 0.1 time delay to approximate this numerator term. And then what we'll do is we'll also take um, the non-dominant time constants. So the ones with the lowest taus, okay, we'll keep the one with the highest tau. So the, the highest tau is referred to as the dominant time constant. You don't want to uh, make a, a time delay approximation for that one. Okay, that one preserves the, uh, is, is going to be our approximation for the first order response. Uh, but we can take the ones with 
uh, smaller time constants and then throw those into the time delay as well. Okay, so uh, if you remember, uh, this would be, uh, it would be e approximately equal to 1 over e to the 3s, but then we'll just invert that and do e to the negative 3s here. And the same thing for this term. So the numerator added 0.1 uh, of time delay, and then this term added 3 uh, units of time delay, and then this one added 0.5 units of time delay. And then we'll just add those up. So this is going to be 3.5 plus 0.1 more. So it's going to have 3.6 units of time delay. And then we keep our dominant time constant, the 5, uh, right here, and then have the negative 3.6 uh, units of time delay. So let's plot this and see how well this approximation worked for uh, this higher order system. Okay, so here is the uh, the Taylor series. Okay, so that was our approximation of this higher order system. The higher order system you can see in the, in the solid line. So we actually approximated it very well. We were able to take a higher order system and get it back into a first order system where we have some anal additional analysis tools to be able to work with first-order systems. Another approach is called the Skogestads uh, method. Uh, I, you know, I actually met uh, uh, Sigurd uh, Skogestad at a conference, and, and I was talking with him about how he came up with this method, and, and he said, well, you know, it just kind of works. Um, but his method, his method is to keep the dominant time constant, in this case, uh, you would keep the 5, okay, the 5 uh, for the, the tau, but then the next dominant time constant, in that case, the next dominant time constant was the 3, okay, so it was the next highest one. And what you do is you take half of that and throw it in with the dominant time constant and then take half of that and throw it in with the time delay. Okay, so in that case, uh, you would take... 1.5, which is half of this one, and then throw it in with this time constant, so it would make it 6.5, and then you uh, would throw the other 1.5 into the other time delay, which would give you uh, negative 2.1 or 2.1 time delay. Okay, so that was um, his approximation here uh, for a first order plus dead time system. And uh, you can see that, that Skogestad's method works even better than the, the Taylor series approach. Um, you know, and, and the, uh, the plots uh, show that here. I, you know, I personally like to go with Skogestad's method, but Taylor series approximation is, is good as well. Okay, so, so let me talk about also parallel processes. Uh, let's say we have two transfer functions here in parallel. Okay, so we have an input x that both affects, uh, there's an input to both g1 and g2 but then you take the response of both of these. The response of the first one is R. The response of the second one is Q. So uh, Y of S equals R plus Q. Okay, but we have two transfer functions here that are in parallel. Now G2 is a second order process. Okay, so it has, it has two roots in the denominator, two poles, and G1 has one pole in the denominator. It's just a first order system. So what we're going to do is, uh, you know, the, this in parallel, these are additive. Okay, so we have an input x and then an output y or response y. And then we take our g1, which is a first order system, and then g2, which is our second order system. And then we get to combine these two. So we multiply them out, and then we put it into a uh, standard form. Now, standard form has one uh, in all of uh, these locations where... You don't have it multiplied by s. Okay, so you just divide through, and then you can get a gain uh, here. Now you remember this is this is a, a standard form that uh, you know it's easy to see the gain because we remember from the final value theorem that s goes to uh, as s goes to uh, to zero, we get our uh, we use our final value theorem, and uh, then all that's left is going to be k because all of the S terms are going to vanish. Okay, so that's standard form. Uh, now, this was a parallel process. You had a first and a second order system that were combined, and what it resulted in is, is um, a third order system in the denominator and then a second order system in the numerator. Okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is referred to as a lead lag, 
and it, it gives a complicated zero pole uh, form. Okay, so let me give just one hint on uh, problem 6.7. Um, you know, I, I put some homework hints online. Uh, I've changed the problem just a little bit, and I've also uh, given you an Excel spreadsheet so you don't have to manually type in those numbers. Uh, so take a look at the, the online hint, and uh, you know, if you have any questions, just drop me an email or, or send an email to uh, the TAs as well.